Next, let's review the surface markings of some of the major arteries that go through the abdomen. The abdominal aorta begins as a direct continuation of the thoracic aorta at the level of T12 or L1, where the thoracic aorta passes through the diaphragm at what's known as the aortic hiatus, which is approximately the midline of the diaphragm. The abdominal aorta will then descend uh, in the midline, but slightly to the left, just in front of the first four lumbar vertebrae. The total length of the abdominal aorta would be approximately 10 centimeters at most. And usually its internal diameter is approximately two centimeters. In a thin person, pulsations are often seen between the costal margins, especially when the person uh, exhales and holds their breath. This pulsation is completely normal and is not indicative of any pathology. At about the level of L4, or about the level of the umbilicus, the abdominal aorta divides into the common iliac arteries, one for the right and one for the left. At about four centimeters from the midline, they then divide into internal and external branches of the iliac artery. The external branch continues laterally and goes deep to the inguinal ligament. When it runs underneath the inguinal ligament, as it emerges going down towards the thigh, it's known as the femoral artery. So the femoral artery is just a continuation of the external iliac artery. And it's about in the midpoint between the anterior superior iliac spine and the pubic tubercle. So it's about the midpoint of the uh, inguinal ligament, if you place your fingers down, you'll feel the femoral pulse as I'm feeling right now. The renal arteries take off somewhat higher in the right upper and lower quadrant from the abdominal aorta, and they take off at approximately right angles at about the level of L1 or L2. Now let's talk about some of the surface markings of the major abdominal organs. Of course, the position and shape of the viscera depend on the patient's posture versus if they're supine or standing. It also depends on respiration, as many organs are pushed down uh, by the diaphragm with each respiratory cycle. It also depends on the physiologic state of the organ. For example, if you've just eaten and your stomach is full, your stomach will be distended and will be further down in the abdomen. The pancreas, let's talk about that first. The pancreas is not a normally palpable organ. It's a deep structure and it's in the retroperitoneum. It sort of lies in both upper quadrants. Uh, the head of the um, pancreas uh, conforms to the C-shaped curve of the duodenum just to the right of the midline. As the uh, head of the pancreas crosses over the midline, it's known as the, the neck and the body of the pancreas. And from this point, it sort of takes a superior and leftward approach towards the hilar surface of the spleen. The spleen is just inferior to the diaphragm, and it's also found at the levels of the 9th, 10th, and 11th ribs. If we identify a line, actually, Thad, if you could move your, your arm out. If we identify a line in the mid-axilla, the spleen is actually uh, posterior to that mid-axillary line as it runs down the 9th, 10th, and 11th ribs. The spleen lies just above the kidney and behind the stomach. And again, as I said before, oftentimes the tail of the pancreas comes up to the spleen's hilum. Okay, turn back. The liver is the largest organ in the abdomen. In fact, it takes up at approximately one fortieth of the body weight of a normal adult. The liver is in the right upper quadrant, but also crosses into the epigastric area. The superior border of the liver conforms to the shape of the dome of the diaphragm. And because the liver is right underneath the diaphragm, the liver does move with each respiration. At rest, the upper border of the liver is approximately in the fifth costal cartilage in the midclavicular line. The lower border is somewhat of an oblique surface, and as a patient takes a breath, that comes down. And we'll be talking about palpating for the liver edge later in this video. The stomach lies primarily in the left upper quadrant and in the epigastric area. It terminates uh, just across the midline into the duodenum, the first part of the duodenum. Again, the, the shape and structure and location of the stomach uh, varies widely depending on 
the body position as well as the, uh, when the patient last ate. In a thin patient, the stomach oftentimes takes sort of a J shape um, and can drop as low as about the level of the umbilicus before it curves up to the duodenum. In more broadly built patients, the stomach tend tends to lie more transversely rather than a J shape. Uh, again, the stomach is not normally a palpable organ. Also not palpable usually are the kidneys because they are very posterior or retroperitoneal organs. The upper poles of the kidneys are protected by the 11th and 12th ribs posteriorly, although the inferior poles might be approximately 4 centimeters above the iliac crest, which is all the way uh, laterally over here. The normal kidneys are about 11 centimeters long, 5 to 6 centimeters wide, and 3 to centimeters thick, and they're approximately 4 or 5 centimeters uh, from the midline. They're usually located between the 12th thoracic vertebrae to the first three lumbar vertebrae. The bladder, when empty, is posterior to the pubic bones and not palpable. However, as the bladder distends with urine, it becomes dome-shaped and can rise up above the level of the pubic bone towards the umbilicus. Normally, it does not get above a halfway point between the symphysis pubis and the umbilicus, but in pathologic conditions, that can extend all the way up to the level of the umbilicus. Uh, the colon, the large intestine, uh, is approximately five feet long. It begins in the right lower quadrant as the cecum and ascending colon and uh, traver traverses upwards to what's known as the hepatic flexure. At that point, the, we have the transverse colon, which is the area between the um, hepatic flexure and the splenic flexure. This is the longest and most mobile part of the colon, and it may actually sort of cross down the midline and, uh, at the level of the umbilicus before it goes superiorly in towards the left at the splenic flexure. Then we have the descending colon, which comes down from the left upper quadrant to the left lower quadrant. At the brim of the pelvis, the descending colon turns into the sigmoid colon, which then changes to rectum and finally anus. Now we're ready to examine the abdomen. The four steps of the examination begin, of course, with inspection, but then we move right to auscultation, and this is different than in any other organ system. And the reason why we auscultate right after inspection is that any time we would percuss or palpate uh, the abdomen, that can stimulate the, the bowel and falsely increase the uh, bowel sounds. So we always first inspect, and then we move to auscultation right away. And again, the exam is always done on skin uh, and not over an article of clothing or gown. Uh, always warn the patient before you touch their abdomen. Many people are jitterish or ticklish. Uh, so always let the patient know before you actually do a maneuver what you are uh, going to do. And examine from the right side, of course. The first thing we're going to do is just inspect the abdomen. We're going to look at the abdominal skin, see if there's any skin lesions. We're going to look for scars. We're going to look for striae which might be pink or purple and colored and be indicative of Cushing syndrome. We'll look for dilated veins on the abdominal wall, which could be a sign of liver cirrhosis. We also going to look for skin rashes. Uh, oftentimes people will have a rash where their clothing rubs against their skin, so against the, the belt line or else in the inguinal area, you might notice a, a rash. And looking at the umbilicus, you're going to be looking to see if there's any sign of herniation and also look for signs of pulsation on the skin. After you've done a general inspection, then you're going to note the contour of the abdomen. And to do that, you might need to actually uh, look down uh, a little bit tangentially at the abdomen uh, instead of standing straight up. Basically, what you're looking for is this contour here. Uh, in FAD, the contour is basically flat. Uh, the, con the contour can also be concave down, or what we call scaphoid, in which it's sort of uh, depressed or hollowed out. Uh, conversely, it could also be rounded or protuberant or distended, where the actual abdomen is uh, shaped is uh, protuberant. Uh, that could be from uh, because the patient is overweight, from gas, from pregnancy, from ascites, from a tumor. Uh, a protuberant or distended abdomen isn't a specific diagnosis. It's, again, just something you notice in part of your inspection. The next part of the examination is auscultation. So with that, I'm going to place my stethoscope on uh, your skin and listen. 
And we do ask that you listen in all four quadrants. You listen with the diaphragm uh, of your stethoscope and not with the, um, the bell. And gently place the, the diaphragm on the patient's abdomen. Let just the weight of the stethoscope hold it. You don't need to push down hard on the abdomen. Now I'm moving to the right lower quadrant. In the left lower quadrant. In the left upper quadrant. You need to listen until you hear bowel sounds. If you don't hear bowel sounds in a quadrant, you need to listen for a full two minutes before you can say that uh, the bowel sounds are absent in any given quadrant. But normally, bowel sounds uh, are present at a rate of 3 to 34 uh, a minute, so they're usually very easily heard. Also, while you're listening in the upper quadrants, you might notice uh, bruits. Uh, this could be a sound uh, of blockage in either the aorta or the renal arteries. But for a brewery to be significant, it should have both a systolic as well as a diastolic component.